Um, so as some of you may know, some of you may not, I am Kara Stevens. I am the school counselor here at FCA. So I do a lot of, I'm also the director of admissions. <laughs> so I help new students come in. I help our current families. Um, I do scheduling, college, graduation, um, even to the extent of a little bit of counseling as far as like anxiety and stuff like that. So I'm so glad you guys are all here. And so we're gonna talk about CCP. It's going to be a lot of information. Um, and so I will do my best to go through as much as I can and as precise as I can. Um, but there will be time for um, questions at the end. We have OCU that are kind of via Zoom here with us as well. Um, and then we have OUL here with us as well tonight um, to be able to answer questions about their specific schools. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, if you have questions along the way, please don't hesitate um, to just raise your hand and let me know. I am more than happy to just stop where I'm at and answer those questions for you. So this is our annual information session for CCP. So we are required by the state to give this information session to the parents and to the students so that they understand what CCP is, the pros, the cons, all of that. So first question that comes up, what is CCP? CCP is called College Credit Plus and it's Ohio's dual credit program. So what that means is that students can earn both college and high school credit at the same time. They will enroll in colleges and they will adhere to all of the policies that colleges have out there for them. It is open for students in grades 7 through 12. So for next year, 7 through 12. They must be an Ohio resident, obviously, and attend an Ohio secondary school, which everybody does. So you met those requirements already. Um, you can apply to any Ohio public or a participating Ohio private college. So like OUL would be considered the public college, OCU is considered the private college, they're participating. Students can take CCP classes through multiple colleges. We have students who take it through both OCU and OUL. Um, and you, I say you can attend multiple colleges as well. You can choose from a variety of different college level courses. Obviously that depends on placement testing and eligibility rules. Um, but these credits or these college classes that students can take, it can satisfy both high school and college requirements. And so a one three credit hour class, so typically a college course is what's three credit hours. A three credit hour class is equal to one unit in high school. Okay? So they must successfully complete the course to earn the credit. And even if a student fails, withdraws from the course, the college transcript and a high school transcript will reflect that grade. All right, the high school transcript, it will match the college transcript. So if a student starts taking CCP classes and they receive a C or a D, which in college world, that's failing, okay? And most likely won't transfer. It will be on their high school transcript and their college transcript as well. So that's kind of one of the key points is you're starting your college transcript taking these courses. Students can take classes in the summer, the fall, or the spring. They can take courses at the high school, which we have a partnership with Ohio Christian University, so we do offer courses here. That's a part of the student's day. They can take it at the college campus, which how we have some students, they go to OUL to take these classes, or they can do them online. So we've had students take online OCU courses or online OUL courses as well. And we just kind of find them a computer lab here at the school and they do their coursework here. So the first step, how can a student participate is eligibility. So a student is eligible if they meet one of these criteria, they can either um, receive a remediation free score, which is just a certain score on a standardized test that can be ACT, SAT, or AccuPlacer. Or a student can have a cumulative GPA of at least a 3.0. So that's typically what a lot of our students fall under, is as long as they have a 3.0 GPA, they qualify and are eligible, and that's in um, high school courses. 
There's other ways that they can still, like if they have a lower GPA, a 2.75, they can have like an A or B in a certain class. Majority of our students though, they have that 3.0 GPA that makes them eligible. Some of the assessment exams, as I said, includes the ACT, SAT, and then we are qualified to give the AccuPlacer here as well. Once a student applies to the college, um, the college will notify the student um, any other requirements that they have about testing. And the colleges and universities, they will review those scores like using a statewide standard. So step two, so step one, you're eligible. Great, step two is college admission. So then you must apply to the college and you must meet their admission requirements. And so once you do that, there's also what's called a permission slip, which I'll get into all of those different forms and they're in the packet and stuff for you as well. Um, but that is provided with the college application as well. Make sure you're getting in contact with the college to see what their requirements are, when their deadlines are. The college has the final decision on student admission. For at least I know um, OCU, they have, if you're a middle schooler, you can have that 3.0 GPA, but you do have to take the AccuPlacer to qualify. If they are in nine through 12, they just have to at least have that 3.0 GPA. The third step is course registration. So once a student has, they've been eligible, they've been accepted at the college, they then will register for courses, which I do help with that entire process. So it's not like you guys are <laughs> doing it all on your own kind of thing. As I've stated before, CCP courses can take the place and satisfy high school graduation requirements. Um, I can help students understand what that looks like, what classes can transfer for what. Um, it says some high schools have more requirements for graduation than state minimum. Like here at FCA, we do. We require four credits of Bible. So that's more than the state minimum. And senior project. That's stuff that's more than the minimum, okay? Students will have to complete their first 15 credits in what's called level one courses. So level one courses, the colleges will have those posted on their website. And those are courses that a student has to earn 15 credit hours in first before they can move on to level two courses. The colleges will help students as they start registering for the class and stuff like that to see, okay, do you have 15 credit hours in level one? This one's a level two, you need to make sure you qualify for that. All of the courses that we offer here with OCU are all considered their level one courses. Okay, so yep, they must provide those on the website. Once they first complete their first 15, they can then enroll in level two. There are some courses that you are not allowed to take for CCP. Those are kind of listed here. Um, physical education courses, <laughs> that was new because there was a lot of students wanting to take, you know, like yoga and wanting that to suffice for their PE credit. Um, so they did do away with that. Um, any remedial or religious courses and then pass fail courses as well. Other requirements, so the grades, the grades that are earned at the college course, again, I've said this and it will be a little redundant, but we wanna make sure that you guys have all of that information because these are the important parts. It will be on the high school transcript as well. Um, and it is factored into both the college transcript because that is starting once you start, start taking these CCP classes and the high school GPA. Uh, grade weighting. Um, so if a high school uses a graded weighting scale for like honors courses and CCP courses, um, CCP classes are on that. So for example, in just a regular high school level course, an A minus is considered a 3.67 GPA. If a student takes a CCP course, an honors course, and gets an A minus, that's still considered a 4.0 GPA. So that's what it's saying in that these courses are on a weighted grading scale, if that makes sense. Okay, they could, students should consider courses in a career pathway that interests them. A lot of the courses that students are taking are general education <coughs> courses. There's stuff, they're part of when a student would typically go freshman year to college, it is courses that they're gonna have to take no matter what path or major they go down. 
Some may be more specific, like if you get into calculus and statistics and stuff like that. Um, but most of these are going to be general education courses that they take once they get to be a freshman in college. Again, I know it's redundant, but you know, students can take college credit plus courses in the subject areas that will satisfy graduation requirements, such as English. Students can take English Comp 1 or English Comp 2, and that can satisfy the graduation requirement of having to have English credits, okay? And I'll get into all that <laughs> as we go through. Um, but I highly encourage students to work with the school counselors to ensure that you're meeting any mandatory testing as far as state guidelines, um, and just to make sure that we're doing all of that so that they can still graduate. The difference between public school and private school as far as CCP, private school students have to apply for funding. And so with that, they apply for funding through the state of Ohio, ask for so many credit hours, and the state comes back with how many credit hours the student was awarded. Um, so that is one big difference, and they do have to apply every year. So even if you've taken CCP classes this year and applied for funding, you have to apply for funding again the next year and every year after that. Um, we'll walk through a little bit. You establish what's called an Ohio ID, and you request access to the CCP funding application, and you complete the CCP funding application by the deadline, which I will get into all of those deadlines. Then approximately five weeks after the deadline, the funds are awarded, and then you are notified the number of credit hours that your student was awarded to use towards CCP classes. And what that does is the state is then paying for these classes, so you do not pay anything out of pocket for these classes as long as the state has funded them. The funds are limited, and sometimes students aren't given everything that they ask for. Um, it is awarded based on grade level. So they start at 12th grade, and then they work their way down. So typically what we've seen in the past, 12th graders are getting sometimes 20 credit hours paid for. Um, juniors, we've seen probably eight to 10, I think. Um, sophomores, it's been about six, maybe eight. Um, and then it just goes down from there. So if you think about it, typically, if you take two classes, that's six credit hours. So you gotta make sure that when you're applying for funding, you're asking for an adequate number of CCP like hours, credit hours. You will provide a copy of the funding award letter to the college and the high school. Um, when a student uses the state funds, so there's two options. There's option A and option B. Option B is when you use state funding for the, the CCP classes. That is kind of the default. So if you apply for funding, option B is the way it goes. And that is where students will earn both college credit and high school credit. Um, so say you applied for funding and you only received eight credit hours, but your student wants to take three classes. That's nine credit hours and you only have eight that's paid for by the state. We cannot split credit hours. So you cannot use eight and then pay for one. You will only be able to use six and then you have to pay for the other three, if that makes sense. Um, when it is option A, that is self-pay. So that is where the parents are paying out of pocket. And under option A, the family must work with the college to arrange to make payments and stuff like that. With OCU, we do have a partnership so we kind of handle that payment. Um, but with option A as well, the student can choose whether they want high school credit or um, only college credit. So you can choose. And so, but you have to make sure that at the time the student registers for the course, they have to let us know, I wanna use this only for college credit and not for high school credit. So the question, the big question, how do we apply for funding? All right, and I will, if you decide you're for your student to take CCP, I send a lot of emails. I send a lot of reminder emails and a lot of emails outlining all the steps to take and deadlines are coming up. So I will go over all of this continually. Um, but the first step is you create an Ohio ID. It can be completed at any time. It does take a few days if you're new and you haven't created one before. It will take a few days to be assigned. 
if you're a parent of a student who has already taken CCP and you already created one this year, you still continue to use that one. You will be required to log in to, it's called the safe account, is kind of what it's called. You follow the steps in this grand instruction manual and go through all of that. Um, it will, I do have a copy of it, but the actual funding site should be open here soon to where you can start that process. Once you have access to it, um, you are required to complete what's called an intent to participate. So that is just you check marking that, yes, I understand all of the rules and the regulations to CCP and what it means. Um, and that, yes, my student understands as well and they intend to participate in CCP. You will click on the appropriate field, confirm that, and then you, will, you must upload the acceptance letters to the colleges. So if your student is applying to both OUL and OCU, for example, you have to upload both acceptance letters into the safe account portal or the parent portal. The deadline, the funding deadline this year is April 1st. So you kind of have to work backwards in how you're applying to colleges and meeting those deadlines so that colleges can process those applications in order to get you the acceptance letter on time to be able to apply for funding by April 1st. <coughs> so you'll complete all the sections of the funding application. You'll upload the documents. You will request how many credit hours. That's where you will do that. So you'll put in, I want to request 15 credit hours. And you'll hit submit when you are all done. Um, that is the key part, is hitting submit. There's many times I can kind of go in on the back end and see who has started applications, and then I get closer to the deadline and they're still started. You have to go in and actually submit them. Again, uh, you're probably gonna dream of me saying April 1st, April 1st. Um, that is the deadline for submitting the funding application. You will receive an email confirmation. There are no deadlines or there are no extensions to this deadline. If there's any difficulties, there is a um, email address for any like, questions that you may have, issues you run into. Um, there will be many families applying. And so make sure that once you get that acceptance letter, you are applying early. We had one year where we were up against the deadline and the website crashed. Um, with ODE. Thankfully, they extended the deadline, but that's stuff that can happen if you're getting close to the deadline. So just make sure you are applying early. Um, I think I've said this already, you know, five weeks, you'll find out how many credit hours that your student is awarded. You will go back into your Ohio ID portal. You will get that funding letter and you'll provide that letter to both the college and the high school as well. Now to go into a little bit more of, is my child ready for CCP? This is the big question of kind of what you've got to decide and talk about after this meeting. So we're gonna see the differences between high school and college. So when, in the area of tests, in high school, <coughs> tests are given weekly or at the end of a chapter, sometimes that's every two weeks. In college, the tests are generally fewer and they cover much more material. The study time. So in high school, homework can range between one to three hours a day. For college, the standard rule is it's two to three hours of homework for every hour spent in class. If it's a three credit hour class, you're timesing that two to three hours by three, okay? So that is doing, that's about three to five hours a day of just homework for that one class. All right, so there is an increased amount of coursework. Knowledge acquisition, so in high school, information is provided in class most of the time. Um, out of class research doesn't happen very often. In college, it is gonna require more independent thinking. There's longer writing assignments and out of class research and a lot more independent studying that has to be done. Grades, in high school, you've got quizzes, you've got homework, you've got tests, all of those combined into your grade. In college, there are few tests, maybe sometimes no homework. It's writing papers, it's projects and assignments. Um, I can still vividly remember one of my first college courses, my only grades were three tests. And that was my grade for the entire semester. Um, so it's daunting, <laughs> very daunting when, you know, your complete grade counts on three tests. So that's something to keep in mind as well. 
Um, the role of parents, the differences in that. In high school, we're your partner. We want to work with you. We want to make sure your students, you know, you get to work closely with teachers and have their email addresses and call them. In college, the parent's more of just a mentor to the student. The student is the one advocating for themselves. Um, there's a form that's called FERPA. We do try and push that form for our students so that we are able to talk to the parents. Um, but if a student doesn't fill out the FERPA, the college can't talk to the parent. The professor can't talk to the parent. The student has to be their own advocate and really be on top of things. Um, any accommodation. So if a student has an IEP or a 504 plan in high school, we definitely do what we can to accommodate for those students. Colleges, most of them will take a look at those IEPs and 504 plans and all of that, but it's ultimately up to them on what accommodations they give. Um, the benefits, I know I kind of went through all like the negatives and stuff like that, but the benefits is that students are earning high school and college credit at the same time. If your student is ready, they can get a head start on college, which can ultimately save you parents money on tuition um, and textbooks and they get to experience college early and just the level of coursework that's gonna be expected of them when they go to college. They're gonna be a step ahead of their peers who are entering in college for the first time and not having experienced that yet. Um, what are the consequences of underperforming? Um, we have had students who have failed courses, who have withdrawn too late, um, they get in a little too deep and they don't ask for help. So we have had students that have done this before. Um, they, if they don't earn a passing grade, they withdraw too late, it might require them to pay for the course. And those grades that they have earned will be on their high school transcript and their college transcript as well. Um, if a student fails or withdraws often, um, future financial aid, once they go to college, can be affected. Um, they can also be placed on probation, dismissal, or academic promotion or dismissal from the college. Um, for the CCP program, a student is placed on probation if he or she earns less than a cumulative 2.0 GPA, which a 2.0 GPA is equal to a C. So if they have a C um, or below, that's less than a cumulative GPA of a 2.0, or they withdraw from two or more courses in one term, they're put on CCP probation. Um, the student, while they're on probation, they can enroll in one CCP class for the college term, and they may not enroll in the same type of course. So they can't enroll into another English course if that's the one that they received a low grade in. Then their CCP dismissal. If a student is on probation and they do not increase their GPA above or to a 2.0 or above, then they will be placed on CCP dismissal, and they may not enroll in any CCP courses but they can appeal, all right? So there's always that. Um, and the appeals are based on the college. So each college is gonna have their own process on what their appeals is. But there is ways that they can appeal those um, situations. Um, the expenses, we kind of talk about that. Um, there's no cost to the students or families for tuition, fees, and books, as long as you are applying for funding. Um, let me see. Again, if it goes over the state funding amount, that's when the financial responsibility is on the family. Let me see. All right, again, April 1st. <laughs> you must complete the electronic application process and funding by April 1st. Um, you confirm with the college if you're going to use option B or option A. Again, that comes when we register for classes and all of that. Um, if you self-pay, let me see. The student is responsible for tuition, fees, textbooks, all of that. And then under option A, again, you can earn college credit and high school or just college credit only. Option B, all of that will be paid for by the state and they will earn both college and high school um, credit for that. C, yep, I've talked about informing the college of the option choice and the final date to change the election of either option A or B um, is before the college's withdrawal date, when you can withdraw without any penalty. 
Um, let's see, high school counselors, we are there, the support that they receive. Um, I have many students come in and talk to me about their CCP classes <laughs> almost daily. Um, so I am always here to provide assistance to all of our CCP students. Um, there are college advisors as well that can help students. And colleges are, provide the same academic supports to CCP students that they do their traditional um, college students. If you're a student athlete, just make sure you know the OHSAA requirements as far as being eligible. Um, what that is, is that students have to be enrolled in and passing five credits in the preceding quarter. So if someone was playing baseball, they have to have passed five, at least five credits in quarter three, which is right before the baseball season. And so CCP courses can count and help students with that, but summer term CCP courses cannot be used to go into compliance with the OHSAA rules. Okay, most, I mean, we've seen all of these courses transfer. As far as our students, they are transferring to other colleges. Um, some students have to submit a syllabus um, to their college that they go to and the college will review them and say, yep, this matches this course at our college, we'll transfer that in. Um, so always we tell our students, just check with the college you plan on eventually going to to see if it will can, um, transfer. Um, but you can also visit this website, it's like transfercredit.ohio.gov to see how those different courses are transferring. <laughs> Deadlines, April 1st, April 1st, April 1st is when private school families must complete the intent to participate and apply for funding. Let's see, okay. So this is where I kind of going into what does being college ready mean, okay? Not only are you considering is my college or is my student academically ready, but you also want to consider is my student socially ready? There is mature content in some of these courses. If you get into sociology and psychology, there's mature content that might not be appropriate for your student or you feel like they're not mature enough to handle that type of content. Um, the social transition. How's their time management? How do they do with their classes? Do they organize themselves well and use you know, a little planner to keep track of their homework and don't have missing assignments? So those are all key points to think about when you're discussing, is my child ready for CCP? Um, again, it's more than just being academically ready. The grades are on both the high school and the college transcript. And so when you're starting your student's college transcript, that's going to follow them. I always share this quote every year. Um, it's from former Ohio Department of Education um, Chancellor John Kerry. He said, it's critical that participants are college ready. As the few times there has been a problem thus far, it has not been because students were not academically ready, but because they were not mature enough to handle it. Um, and I have definitely seen that as a counselor with students, you know, when we run into problems, it's just because they weren't socially ready to handle that. I like to give statistics on our students and who's taking CCP. Because a lot of times you'll get the vibe of, oh, everybody's doing it, so my kid has to. Not everybody's doing it, all right? Out of grades seven through 12 at FCA this current year, only 24% of our students are taking CCP. Um, 12th grade, that's 63% of the class. 11th grade, we have 38% of the class. And in 10th grade, we have 36% of the class taking CCP classes. We do not have any 7th through 9th graders currently taking CCP. Um, these are no numbers are a little bit down this year from last year, but that's also because we have a lot of students taking advantage of the Career Center now and are going to the Career Center and taking that path, which is awesome. So how do you get started? We're going to go through this one more time. You apply for admission at the college of your choice before their deadline. Um, you contact the college, see if there's any assessment or testing requirements. You start the funding process early and submit that by the deadline. You can meet with your school counselor to discuss any scheduling and graduation requirements. Um, and any questions, you can go to um, higher-ed.ohio.gov. They have a lot of information about CCP on there as well. In your pen to email with them, occasionally and talk on the phone and I know I talk to some of you occasionally as well so 
that door is still open, even though it might be a virtual door, you can still call me, email me, or set up a web conferencing um, appointment anytime uh, to answer questions that you have regarding courses or the program itself, et cetera. Glad to help you with that. And certainly also with the transfer of credit uh, situation, if you have questions about that, we're glad to help with that as well. So I just want to let you know, even though I'm in Michigan now, that doesn't mean I'm not available. I'm, I am not available to you. I, I absolutely am. So feel free to utilize me anytime. Um, well, OCU, uh, we've had a long, we've had a, a really great um, partnership long term with uh, Fairfield Christian Academy. And um, the wonderful thing is that not only are we able to provide a, a, a good, solid, um, education in the discipline area that you are um, that you're looking to take, but also we, we align very well um, with um, some of our our, own, our personal beliefs. And so OCU it prepares students um, to not only serve effectively in the work that they're planning to do in um, in their chosen field, but also providing. Uh, service to you know their their churches, their schools, their communities um, in a in a Christ-filled or in a holistic Christ-centered way, and um, so it's wonderful to have that um, aspect that in common that we do. Um, so getting into the nitty gritties, our our admissions requirements. Um, kind of let her get that advanced. There we are. <laughs> so. If your student has a minimum of 3.0 cumulative GPA in their high school work, then they are, testing for acceptance is then not needed. If your student is between 2.0 and 2.99, um, we would require them to take the reading at placer in order to establish um, readiness for college level work. Um, and then otherwise, testing would only be needed for um, English composition or for a math course. And um, I think, I haven't talked with uh, Ms. Stevens about this, but I think she's still willing to serve as an AccuPlacer teacher. Should we, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, should we need that? So, um, which is a really advantage, a real great advantage to all of you to be able to have that opportunity. Uh, middle school students, um, you would be tested via the AccuPlacer reading regardless of what your GPA is. Um, and that is simply because I, I want to never, ever, ever put a student in a position where they're um, not ready to be able to take take on the coursework that they're looking to take on. Um, in our application process, uh, we work very, very closely in alignment with FCA. Um, you would, if you're a new student, you would complete the online application at our website. Um, that information, I'm sure, is in your packet. It's also at our website. You can, which I encourage all of you to do, is to go to Ohio Christian University website and um, move, toggle your way into the Trailblazer Academy it's part of the site and look that over. Um, if your student is a return student, if they're currently taking classes um, and they're wanting to take classes next year, we need there's a form called the the notice of student continuance form and that is also on our website that may also be in your paperwork in your packet I don't know um, but that would need to be re um, completed so that we we know that you're in uh, the pipeline to be able to take classes with us next year and an updated transcript so that we can just make sure we've got updated information and then uh, we can uh, work with you to get your re your return um, uh, acceptance letter to you so that you can submit it to the state. For the new students, though, um, you do complete the online application. You do submit the, the high school transcript. Um, you do submit the permission slip. And then you submit either ACT, SAT, AccuPlacer, or testing if needed. And if we need to test you, we'll work with that. Um, so in our course options, um, we, we do have a, a really lovely selection of courses that you can take there at FCA. 
Um, and, you know, we're hoping to grow that um, as the, the program has just been a really good, solid program, and we're at a place that we can build on that, and that's terrific. Um, but we also do offer coursework online to, to your students um, and to the campus. If they are, uh, have freedom in their schedule and they're able to come to the OCU campus, they certainly can do that as well. And they can take a combination of those as well. Um, the level one course lists are on our website um, and our course schedules mostly are posted for fall and spring. Summer will be posted soon. And we will also have um, an additional set of courses being posted for the fall for online work. Um, so you can go to the courses page on our website and you can check into those if online is something you're interested in or on campus. Um, and we have multiple degree pathways. Certainly, you know, we want you to certainly concentrate on your general eds because that's going to be really important for any student to um, center on to be sure that you're meeting requirements that every, every, any college would have. But there may also be additional courses in the area that you are looking to study that you can take additional coursework on once you've met your level one requirements. Um, and I'm happy to talk with you about those when the time comes. Um, so once you've, ex you've, accept you've turned in all of your materials for acceptance, you received your acceptance letter, and in that acceptance letter we'll also give you information and a link to our advising web page. And then there's a, you will watch the video and um, there's an advising checklist to so that you make sure, yep, I'm, I'm turning in all of the, the paperwork that I need to turn in. And so that includes the college environment agreement that just talks about this is a college environment. You're going to be expected to, um, uh, you know, respond in the way that we expect a college student to respond and that there may be subject material, material that may be um, adult centered, et cetera. Just the things that, um, that tell you a little bit about what's different about being in a college environment as opposed to a high school environment and to make you aware of that ahead of time and that you've read through that and understand that. Um, the FERPA release form, uh, um, giving us permission to interact with your parents. Um, and then two forms that are required by the state, which is student questionnaire and the mature content permissions for new students. So once we have those materials, um, then we're ready to register you. And that will be the next step. Um, you will work certainly with Ms. Ms. Um, Stevens, Mrs. Stevens, as well as myself, um, so that we're making sure that you're being enrolled in the in the coursework that's appropriate for you. So on the next slide, there is a picture of a registration form. That form will be turned in along with the other advising paperwork, and that is annually. So every year we need a new set of um, the advising forms along with your registration form for the first time for the fall or for the summer, whichever is your first semester. And then after that, um, just the registration form from there. So um, I get students that say, oh, I'm a return student. I don't need to fill out all the advising forms. Well, yes, you do, because we want to make sure you're on the, we're on the same page for the, for, the new, for the new semesters, for the new school year as well. Um, so transferability, as um, Mrs. Stevens said, um, we, we really have very good transferability with not just in the state of Ohio, but even outside of the state of Ohio. Um, we're accredited with the Higher Learning Commission, as is OU and OSU and various other um, schools that you're familiar with um, that are regionally accredited. And we are part of the transfer evaluation system as well as transferology. You can look into that. However, if there's some coursework that you don't see featured there between us and the school that you're looking into, contact me about that. Sometimes it may be just a matter of we haven't done a transfer study with that particular course, so we can take care of that with you, with that school. Um, just contact me and I'm, I'm happy to help you. Um, you know, some of the benefits, same as really don't have much to add to what Mrs. Stevens shared with you. It's just really, um, you know, especially having classes there at the, at the, at the um, FCA, that gives you a chance to get you, dip your toes in and begin to understand the world of college and what college professors are expecting and what college work is like. Um, it helps you get some things done ahead of time so that you're able to get into your core coursework a little sooner. 
it's a good savings. And with OCU, we also have the Early Admit Scholarship for students who participate in the Trailblazer Academy Dual Enrollment Program. Um, and so if you at least complete six credit hours with us and you are at, uh, maintain a 3.0 credit hour um, GPA, or I'm sorry, 3.0 GPA throughout your um, career with us as dual enrollment students, you could be made eligible then for the early admit scholarship, which is renewable each year, and especially for our dual enrollment, our student, our Travelers Academy students. So we want to award you and thank you for for doing such a great job as dual enrollment students with our program. So when you can use that scholarship to, as you matriculate and as a full-time OCU student. And as I said, that's renewable each year. Um, so some of the important dates, um, all of our non-public students, as Mrs. Stevens said, um, we are needing all of your application materials in by March 17 to help you be able to meet the April 1st deadline. Um, we certainly, that doesn't mean we wouldn't accept a, an application after that, it just means that um, we may or may not be able to get your materials back to you in order or your acceptance back to you in, in time for the April 1st deadline. Or if you're self-pay, et cetera, there's, there's other things that we can make exceptions to, but for the most part, March 17th is the deadline. Um, the registration deadline for uh, fall is June 30th. It's a little early, it's a bit earlier than what, we ha what we've had in the past, but we want to, um, there really isn't any reason not to go any later than that, especially when we're working very closely with your school. The goal would be to have you guys ready to go, registered by the end of May when you finish up high school, and then when you come back in um, in August and you're beginning to get ready to go, it would just be a matter if you need to do any schedule changes, that's fine, but otherwise you've got everything ready to go. Um, so uh, testing is also something we can work with uh, so if there's any testing that's needed before June 30th absolutely want to get that done but if there's add-on courses that you're like maybe you're thinking I might want to add on a math course but I don't know I don't have a, a test to qualify me we can work that out okay so um, you can contact us uh, here's I think in your packets you also have that information it's certainly also on our website um, and all of the deadlines and more deadlines are also all listed on our dates and deadlines page on our website. You can certainly contact me. My, my name is, again, is Beth Ash. Um, our program coordinator is Avery Cavanaugh. She works with all of your acceptance paperwork to get you uh, ready to go and um, certainly can help you with testing. Uh, as well as so as uh, uh, Mrs. Stevens. So thank you. I know you've got uh, someone else that is ready to speak to, but again, thank you for having me here with you guys tonight. And I'm, I'm happy. I'll hang out for questions later on. Okay. Thank you, Beth. Mm -hmm. All right. So I will um, just kind of give some final just reminders and stuff like that. Um, the deadline to apply to OCU is March 17th. Um, I will be sending out... Um, emails so please continue to read those deadline for ccp funding is april 1st and the deadline to apply to oul is may 1st again final reminders acceptance letters a lot of the colleges now are communicating via email so acceptance letters are coming to whatever email that whenever the student or you help them apply whatever email is listed on the application that's where they're sending the acceptance letters and all of the corresponding information. So email is very, very important. Um, I know I probably like spam your guys' inbox all the time with lots of emails, um, but please take the time to make sure you're reading them because I do very much try to outline things in detail for you so that nobody misses deadlines and misses out on these opportunities. Um, follow the CCP checklist. It's gonna be your best friend while you're going through this process. And of course, there's my email um, and phone number as well. Please call me or email me if there are any questions along the way. Um, so that's the end. Yes, Miss, this is Phyllis Lanier. Um, she is from OUL. You come on up and present whatever you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. You did not stress April 1st enough. 
Oh, yeah. I was going to say, maybe I'll say it a few more times. <laughs> for the entire academic year. Mm -hmm. And the state, I do not know of an exception. I, mean, no. I did not mm -hmm. know about that one. And you do have to have, upload an acceptance letter. So please, 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 if there's nothing worse than an OCU or another student that did not do that by that deadline, and tell them they're out for the year. Mm -hmm. So if you do anything, the letter of intent and that, we can work around other dates, yep. but we cannot work around them. So I just Then please make sure you're putting your student's grade for next year. Right. I had a junior who was going to be a senior apply as a junior and didn't get a maximum number of credit hours that they could have gotten because they put that they were a junior, <laughs> not a senior. Okay, so please make sure when you're applying for funding, you're putting what grade your student will be in next year taking these courses. If you do anything, please do that. Yes. <laughs> but um, most of the information is the same as Kara mm -hmm. had said. Our deadline is May 1st, but you want to have that before. You would do everything is the same. So you want that, you want to apply, have your transcript. We have a student page that you have to sign. The student mm -hmm. has to sign as does a parent or guardian. You want all of that in by the deadline. That's what would make your admission status, you know, admitted to the program. At Ohio University, if you're an eighth or have not finished your ninth grade, you are required to do the active placer. Very similar. So it is high school credit, so that's why you're required to do that. Ninth through twelfth. If you've ended your ninth grade, then the 3.0 is, is fine. And we are here to help you with mm -hmm. all of that also. So that was really, mm -hmm. I just want to stress the April first because we're, we have to face you and say, I'm sorry, there's nothing you can do. Yeah, Which yeah. breaks my heart. <laughs> and then we do need the funding letter or you stay as option A mm -hmm. and our self-pay. So as she yep. stressed, I mean, you did everything. I just <laughs> want to stress the few that I see students get. And so... Instead of your tuition being free, you may see a bill for fifteen thousand or fifteen hundred dollars. So please get that funding letter to your school wherever you mm -hmm. decide to go. And I'll be back here to answer yep. any questions if you need anything. Other than that, it was pretty much the same. So I yeah, awesome. Sound good. Thank you, Walker. And then, Perfect. guys, as you're thinking about the classes that your student might want might want to take, all right, from personal experience of what we've done in the past, um, typically, as you saw, most students start in tenth grade. That's what we've seen. Um, they start with 10th grade. They have to take a U.S. history course as part of their graduation requirements. So we have a U.S. history CCP course that they take their 10th grade year, typically. So they can choose between taking that for high school credit or they can take it for CCP and get both. Um, our HOPE, 11th grade, um, they have to take um, American government as part of their graduation requirements. That's why we're hoping that we can add American government CCP to be able to increase that for our juniors. Um, so it's stuff like that. So again, it is open for students in grades seven through 12. Um, absolutely, if you feel like your middle schooler is ready, um, then we will help you through that process. Um, and we will be there to help through as they're taking the class as well. Um, but we do think that we've seen the most success for our students once they start, once they've gotten through that ninth grade year and they know what a high school level course is like, and then they know what to gauge a college level course, which is gonna be a step above. So, it's my kind of commercial, <laughs> I guess, per se. Um, on that, if you guys have questions, please let me know. I will be up here, Mrs. Kenneckel, um, our principal this year. That's kind of our new roles this year. She's principal, I'm school counselor. Um, we, but she's been in this program um, as well and can help with any questions as well. So thank you guys so much for coming out and spending your evening here. Um, we will be here if you have any questions. So thank you for coming. <laughs>